The board now reconvenes this meeting of the Plano ISD Board of Trustees in open session at 7.08 p.m. on September 6, 2016 at the Plano ISD Administration Building. I'm Missy Bender, President of the Plano ISD Board of Trustees, and on the board's behalf, I wish to extend a warm welcome to all who are present and to our web and video viewers. We will conduct our meeting focusing on the district's two major goals. One is to ensure continued improvement in student learning, and two, ensure the efficient use of resources. Let me introduce my fellow trustees and staff. Seated to my left are Dr. Bingley, Superintendent of Schools, Nancy Humphrey, Board Vice President, Trustees Tammy Richards and David Stolle, Susan Modisette, Assistant Superintendent for Campus Services, Dr. Matthew Gutierrez, Assistant Superintendent for Employee Services, and Dr. Jim Wusso, Assistant Superintendent for Academic Services. Seated to my right are Carolyn Mo Mobius, Board Secretary, Trustees Marilyn Hinton and Dr. Yoram Solomon, Dr. Carrie Cooper, Assistant Superintendent for District Services, Steve Fortenberry, Chief Financial Officer, Dan Armstrong, Assistant Superintendent for Technology Services, Carla Oliver, Assistant Superintendent for Government, Community, and Planning Initiatives, and Denise Gillespie, Executive Assistant to the Superintendent Board of Trustees. There's a test later on how many times I said the word superintendent. <laughs> uh, let's start out by also thanking uh, members of our financial services department for serving as greeters and for distributing the agendas and comment cards. Please join us in applauding these staff members for their assistance this evening. At this time, I'd like to invite Tammy Richards to share an inspirational message. Thank you, Missy. I grew up in San Antonio, Texas and had the privilege of going to Sam Rayburn Middle School. At Sam Rayburn in seventh grade English, I had a wonderful teacher named Mrs. Linda Ritter. Mrs. Ritter was very wise. She was smart enough not to tell us 13 year olds that we were her very first class. <laughs> it was her very first time to teach. But it was very important to her to bring the literature and the poetry that we were reading to life. And so to do that, she actually brought in a friend who was a poet. Her name was Naomi. And so in the class, she actually wrote poems, short poems for all the students. And I, I've kept to, to today the one that was written for me. And so I'd like to share it now. And I've got some, some visual aids. Loose leaf is better than bound notebook because it can be added to and subtracted from without being torn. As we go through this school year and we're looking at doing some very new and innovative things like a new early type of early childhood school, uh, additional high school academies, a new performing arts center, I want to invite all of us, parents, community, educators, to be loose leaf, to be open to things that can be added to the things that we bring to our students so we can give them the best educational experience. Thank you. Now please join us as we stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> The board will hear some reflections from Plano ISD senior high school students who were selected to participate in this UTD Summer Scholar Program. I invite Susan Modisette to introduce this instructional focus. I'm just going to turn it over to Karen Shepard who will introduce um, the, our six speakers this evening. Hello, board. This is our 12th year of our UTD Scholars and we are so thankful for this uh, sponsorship that UTD does for our kids. We had nine scholars this year, and six of them have managed to join us tonight. So first, uh, the one that couldn't join us is Catherine. So I wanted just to show her PowerPoint here, right here, it's right here. <laughs> uh, Bill, there it is. All right, so Catherine worked under Dr. Theodore Price, and she just at the last moment couldn't be with be with us today and she just wanted to say thank you to everybody. Now for our other six, trying to get six people to present in less than 10 minutes was their challenge. So we are gonna call this the closing ceremonies for the UTD scholars. 
Every year when I go to International Science Fair, we take the kids to see the Nobel laureates, and it's an awesome opportunity for the kids um, to get to see these Nobel laureates talk, but the first thing they all do is in a minute or less, they have to tell what they won the Nobel Award for. So our scholars have been challenged with, they're gonna have one minute, there's a timer that will start as soon as they get up here and introduce themselves. So you will see this little black circle and it'll disappear and when it's gone, their time is up. So they have all practiced their speeches and they're ready to go. So here we go. Miss Joanna. You ready? Get up there where they can hear you. Okay. Go. Hi, my name is Joanna Martin, and this summer I had the opportunity to work with Dr. Hassan and the graduate students in the heat transfer lab in the mechanical engineering department. While I was there, the graduate student I was working with was preparing for her PhD dissertation this fall. Her experiment was to heat wax and other materials on a hot plate and see the movement of the heat waves by taking pictures with a CCD camera. My job was to learn how to operate the CCD camera and help take the pictures during the experiments. While I was over the eight weeks of the program, I also had the opportunity to go to lectures given by visiting professors, as well as learn how to use um, an operative PIV system. I'd like to thank Dr. Fantano and Ms. Shepard for um, all the time and effort they put into making the program possible, as well as the Plano ISD School Board for allowing the program to happen. I'm so glad I got to be a part of such an educational and fun experience this summer. Thank you. Like 10 seconds left. Ah. <laughs> Alright, you ready? Yeah. Go. Hi, I'm Ira. I'm currently a senior at Plano West, and this summer I had the opportunity to work in a chemistry lab under UTD Provost Dr. Inga Musselman. I was also aided by faculty such as Dr. Edson Perez, who's a postdoc, and two PhD students in the lab. And my job was to make a film membrane which would separate gases such as hydrogen and CO2. And this is really useful in industrial application when we use gas for natural energy or gas for just our energy in our homes. And my job was to make this PBI film as thin as possible, even going into the nanometer scale. So the gray and white image is actually a SEM, which is a scanning electron microscope. And it like, shows images on that very small scale and this is one of them, and I was actually able to use this advanced technology and learn about the different types of machinery in the lab. And overall, I just want to say thank you all for this amazing opportunity. You ready? Yeah. Hello, my name is Ritvik Ramesh, and I'm a junior at Plano East Senior High. Uh, this past summer, I got the opportunity to work with Dr. Venkateshan and Rahul Hayaran uh, on uh, developing an automatic precision agriculture system. The idea of this is that we can use sensors connected to Arduinos to gather specific data about the crops that we're growing and send that to a Raspberry Pi which can make decisions about uh, what agricultural processes we should uh, do and when and in what quantities. So this will definitely help to save precious resources such as water, fertilizer, and others. And I would definitely like to thank Ms. Shepard, Dr. Pantano, and Plano ISD for this great experience as I got to learn about the university lab environment and just how fun uh, science is overall at a university level. Thank you. Timer going. Are you ready? Yeah. Go. Hello, my name is Rahul Hayaran. I'm currently a junior at Plano East for the IB program. And I worked at UTD with Rithvik and Dr. Venkatesan on a project which involved automated agriculture. Now, while Rithvik was working on the farming side of things, I worked on the completely opposite end of the spectrum. And I was working specifically on computer science and cybersecurity. My job was to make sure that all the devices that we're using are able to communicate effectively and securely with, an, with one another which involved that I had to design a security protocol and after that build it using uh, C programming. After I built that algorithm, I was really happy because we were able to run it and all the communications were perfectly fine. And so this lab opportunity not only gave me the ability to learn a new programming language and security concepts, but learn the soft skills that are even more important, like presenting research or talking to a professor. I'm really grateful to the board, PISD, and UTD for this phenomenal experience. Thank you so much.
Go. Hi, my name is Caitlin Lee, and I'm a junior at Plano West. And this summer I got to work in the psychology lab with Dr. Ackerman. So um, I worked with one of his um, undergraduates, and we worked on a paper called The Roles of Nar Grandiose and Vulnerable Narcissism in First Impressions in the, of the Big Five Traits. And what we basically did was analyze how two different types of narcissists are judged in first impressions. So actually, um, the undergraduate um, emailed me recently and told me that she submitted our paper to a conference and it was submitted, I mean, it was accepted. So that means if all goes well at the conference, then our paper could be published in a journal. Um, uh, <laughs> oh, uh, uh, oh, this was a great experience. Um, I learned a lot and thank you. <laughs> Hi, my name is Nisha Rajesh, and I'm a senior at Plano Senior High School this year. And I had the great opportunity with working, for working with Dr. Meridad Nirani and UTD's Quality of Life Lab. I was able to gain many experiences and actually had the opportunity to start my own project. At first, I was developing a smart table map that could track the dietary and nutritional intake of people, but, was, but, but faced a dead end due to inc inconclusive results. However, I spent a couple of days and I decided to research on prominent biomedical issues and I came up with a new project. So currently I'm working on designing an insole that serves as an, a foot ulcer tracker and a, a fall detection system for all types of patients. I was able to collect data for 50 different types of people over the summer and I'm actually continuing my work in the lab to develop a program that can personalize insoles for people with different types of feet. I have been able to gain a lot of experience from this, such as working in a, an undergraduate lab, and I, I couldn't have asked for a better summer. On behalf of the UTD Summer Scholars, I would like to thank the Board of Trustees, um, Plano ISD, UTD, and Dr. Pantano for giving us such a wonderful opportunity to perform research and to learn about the realm of science. Thank you so much for your time. Do you have any questions for us? <laughs> <laughs> I just have to say, it's, it, I'm so happy that y'all came back and talked to us about your experiences over the summer and it really, of what I could understand, <laughs> it made me wish I was there at least to see, you know, some of the days when you were in the lab. Um, my son had met the person who developed the C program, I know I'm not saying it right, but he said that that guy is um, really amazing and he, that program is really very useful going on that into college so through college but thank y'all for sharing everything that's just really exciting some such wonderful experiences i did have one question i think uh, in the pink you you said something about a ptb program pid system yeah. what's it pid system what is that um you like you use a laser and another like camera thing to take pictures and mm -hmm. then so the question I have, Nishi, you said you were going to continue your research. Is that going to be part of the uh, science and engineering fair research, or is that just going to be something you do on your own? This is, I'm, I'm really interested, after doing the internship, I've actually decided that I want to major in electrical engineering, right. which is what I researched in. So this is mainly out of my own interest because um, I'm actually going to be attending um, um, conferences in the second semester, so we're trying to work on trying to pub publicize this uh, work so I can take it on to different conferences. Oh, good luck. Thank you. Are they all juniors or seniors? Both. So oh, juniors and seniors. Both. Raise your hand if you're a senior. There you go. Mr. Juniors. Okay. Was UTD successful in recruiting anyone mm -hmm. to go to school? Like I'm in the process of applying to UTD, okay. so it's definitely an option for me. Yeah, okay. Me okay. Very good. Did this summer help you figure out what you want to do? Yes. yes. <laughs> Did anybody tell you not to mix Arduinos with raspberry pies? <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Karen, for helping to coordinate this, and thank you, students, for your interest to apply and to spend your summer this way. It sounds like you were, uh, it was a good experience for you. 
So good luck to you all, and thank Love you. you. Thank you. Now we will move on to the recognition part of our agenda. Carla, do we have any student guests to be recognized this evening? No, I don't believe so. No cards were turned in for that. Okay. Um, we'll take just a moment here, and uh, Dr. Bengali would like to make some uh, special recognition comments. Well, I'd like to recognize the fact that um, most of you know by now we opened school, and we did so in an incredibly uh, smooth fashion. And uh, I, I just want to say to our nearly 55,000 students, some of them are here with us tonight, welcome back. We are glad you make our building schools again when you come back. Uh, but as much as anything else, too, I, I want to say to everybody, and um, I want to thank all the employees in PISD. You know, our, our kids come back, things work smoothly, there's a schedule for them, there's a place for them, they have them. It just does not happen. It takes a ton of work from a lot of people in, in our departments, in our schools, in our buses, in our cafeteria. And I met with bus drivers before the year started. I met with uh, food service workers before the year started. It all takes a lot of people coming together. And even with a torrential rain on day one, if you remember that, fortunately our elementary kids were mostly home. Um, it, it was a very smooth opening. So I just want to say thank you to all the people in PISD that made that happen for our kids. Let's give them a little applause. Yeah. I, I know Dr. Bingley loves to love on our teachers and our staff members and our students. So I know he enjoys any opportunity to share that enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I will now call upon Carla Oliver to introduce our PTA Back to the Future recognition. Uh, Secretary Carolyn Mobius will read the resolution, and then Vice President Nancy Humphrey will present the resolution to the Plano ISD Council of PTA's President Penny Chapman, who is then invited to make some brief comments. So, Ms. Oliver, would you like to kick this off? Yes, just a couple of quick things before uh, Ms. Chapman comes forward. So we wish to welcome our Plano ISD Council of PTAs tonight. So please stand. I know that I see a couple of you. So if you would please stand so that we can recognize that you're here. These are die-hard volunteer yes. fans. And particularly at this time of year, the PTA focuses on membership and that means a lot to all of us. We sincerely thank our, our district PTAs for your service to the students of Plano ISD. Like Dr. Uh, Bingley just mentioned, we had a very smooth opening of school, and we know that PTA offers a great deal of volunteerism to make sure that that happens as well. So just a, a thank you and, and kudos from us as well there. Um, so again, thank you for the kickoff. I'd like to invite President Penny Chapman to the podium as our new um, Plano ISD PTA's council president. Um, while the resolution is being read. Whereas Texas PTA Parent Teacher Association is the largest child advocacy grassroots association in Texas with more than 500,000 members, and whereas the Plano ISD Council of PTAs is the umbrella organization established in 1989, which represents 55,000 Plano ISD students through 70 local PTAs. Its members have been leaders and advocates for the children of our community who benefit from valuable programs, resources, and a voice at the Texas Capitol. And whereas the mission of Texas PTA, the Plano ISD Council of PTAs, and our 70 local PTAs is to make every child's potential a reality by engaging and empowering families and communities to advocate for our children and to set a foundation for today's youth to become tomorrow's leaders, lifelong learners, and meaningful contributors to our society. And whereas research indicates there is a direct correlation between high student achievement, higher child self-esteem, and future positive contributions to society, successful students are everyone's business, and successful schools build successful communities. And whereas the PTA tagline, Back to the Future, signifies a renewed commitment by all sectors of our Plano ISD community to advocate for our local children, including businesses, retailers, residents without current students, 
civic groups, community officials, families, and educators. Now therefore, be it resolved that the members of the Plano Independent School District Board of Trustees will back the future of our local children by raising public awareness and encouraging public discussions about the importance of community-supported education and PTA's contribution to its, to its success. This day, September 6, 2016. Well, I want to present to you on behalf of the board a res the resolution that Ms. Mobius just read. And I had the pleasure of joining your board planning meeting last week and got to hear all the wonderful uh, backgrounds. I would tell you what, we're in good hands. So <laughs> congratulations and thank you. Thank you for the partnership you have with our district. I actually don't have very many comments, but I would like to make a few. First of all, thank you all so very much for being as supportive as you are for our PTAs in Plano ISD. Um, I have met with many other uh, districts through the summer during trainings in uh, San Antonio and Austin, and they are envious of what we have here because we have such a great um, leadership team to work with. So first and foremost, thank you. Uh, secondly, our big, uh, big issue this year is advocacy for our children. And advocacy counts from the number of voices that we have for our children. Texas PTA has challenged us to have a voice for every child. Um, in order to do that, we would need over 50, about 55,000 memberships in PTA. Currently, Plano PTA has seen their membership decline over the last seven years. Uh, I would like to challenge all of you to help me, help us in rectifying that and turning that around. Um, I know we're not going to get to 55,000 this year because we currently have, from last year, about 23,000 members but I would like to challenge each of you to help us get the word out. We're going to be doing a lot of um, getting out in the neighborhoods. I grew up in a very small town where my high school was 100 students. Uh, and if, when we had a football game or we had a play or we had a concert, everybody in town was there. It was a community event. And I know Plano's a lot bigger, and I know we have a lot more than 100 students, probably in one class. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would love to see us get behind our students and back them like a small town would. So we're looking forward to seeing lots of these signs. It says, I am blank and I back the future. And you'll notice the you in community. We would like to invite all of you to be part of this and back the future at planopta.org. There's a nice round button that says join today. And you can join any number of PTAs that you would like. Um, anyone who joins five or more, which is a theater pattern in Plano, uh, we will have some special recognition for you. So thank you again so much. Penny, I have a question for you Yes, regarding membership. Mm -hmm. um, don't we allow students in high school to be members as well? We allow students of any age to okay. be members. Okay. Um, Texas PTA changed that recently where anyone from birth on up can be a PTA member. So whether you currently have children in school, you are a child in school, um, you ha are a business owner, you've never had children, you never want children, it doesn't really matter. As long as you want to support the Plano ISD community, you can be a PTA member. And we all know that, like the resolution mentions, good schools build good communities and no, no one wants to live in a community where you don't have good schools. So it helps, it's really on all of us to change our membership and to advocate for all of the kids through this. Thank right. you. Thank you. I don't think I could have said that better myself. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Chapman. Thank you very much. We will now move to the regular public comment portion of our agenda. For the public comment portion, the board has public comment cards that are accepted from 6 to 7 p.m. Cards are not accepted after 7 p.m. and they are not transferable to any other party or speaker. All cards are collected and given to Carla Oliver or a representative of the Communications Department who will present the speakers during this time. Ms. Oliver, do we have any speakers for public comment? No, ma'am, we don't. Okay. Thank you. So let's move forward to the consent agenda. Uh, this includes personnel recommendations, minutes of previous meetings, bids, purchases, and construction items. Are there any requests to remove an item or items from the consent agenda for further discussion? All right, 
hearing none, uh, do I have a motion to accept the consent agenda as presented? Um, Second. All, any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. Motion passes unanimously. Okay. Now that we've approved the consent agenda, we'll move forward with uh, agenda items for discussion and action. Uh, the first one is to discuss a recommendation to terminate employment of a term contract employee. Uh, do I have a motion? I move that we approve the administration's recommendation to, um, uh, regarding the termination for good cause of a term contract employee. And do we have a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. Motion passes unanimously. Our next item is super exciting. <laughs> it's the adoption of the 2016-17 proposed tax rate. At this time, I will invite Steve Fortberry, our CFO, to present information about the proposed tax rate. What better for an exciting topic to have such an exciting speaker? <laughs> <laughs> Should be thrilling. Uh, tonight, usually when we adopt the tax rate, uh, in all seriousness, it's a fairly quick presentation. Uh, because of the extraordinary increases in property values and their impact on the taxpayer's final tax bill, uh, I did want to spend a little more time on it tonight uh, so that any viewers or anyone in the audience will have a little bit better understanding as to, to why we recommend adopting the same rate that, uh, that we had last year. Uh, and very quickly, our budget and tax rate calendar actually starts in November when we adopt kind of a a calendar and, and goals for the following year. Uh, so we've been going through the budget and tax rate process now for about nine or ten months and it kind of culminates tonight. You adopted the budget back in June but we wait until we, we received the certified values in July and then this year we had a, a bond sale August 2nd so that factors into the, the INS or debt service tax rate. So we get all that information then tonight, we actually uh, recommend your adoption of a tax rate. The proposed tax rate uh, that we have tonight is the same as the, is last year's actual rate. It's a total of $1.43.9. That's divided $1.17 for maintenance and operations and $26.9 for our debt payments. Quick comparison over uh, the last 11 or 12 years. If you look all the way back to 2006, before the state uh, lost a lawsuit, and uh, in answer to that, uh, had a tax rate compression process where districts had to lower their tax rates, and the state, uh, for some period of time anyway, made up that money. Uh, the rate back then was over a dollar 73, so the rate uh, that we're recommending is still about 30 cents below where that rate was back in 2006. Uh, it is the same rate as last year but it's slightly less than the rates the, the two years prior to that. As far as taxes on an average residence, uh, despite the fact that the rate's staying the same, uh, the value of that average residence has, has gone up this year. And so the taxes on an average residence this year would be four thousand two hundred eighty-five dollars. Uh, that is up about three hundred eighty-seven from last year. As we talk about recapture in a little bit, I'd just like you to note that of that three hundred eighty-seven dollar increase, three hundred and three dollars of that will go to the state in terms of recapture. Uh, and then if you look again back to 06, uh, this is actually the first year that. Uh, because of the decrease in the tax rate uh, back in 2006, this is actually the first year that the actual taxes on that average residence uh, will exceed what it was 11 years ago. As far as proposed area tax rates, we still rate next to last uh, in the county, uh, second to the lowest only to Farmersville. Uh, I would note on here Frisco was fourth from last. Uh, that 
their proposed tax rate included their 13 cent TRE. Since that did not pass, they'll still be slightly above us, but they'll swap places with, uh, with Blue Ridge ISD on this list. So the, the question that gets asked a lot is with all the growth in property values, why can't we lower the tax rate? And the simple answer is really one word, it's recapture. Uh, and to give you some idea of the extent of how uh, we're limited by recapture, I think it's kind of good to look at, at three scenarios. You'll see on here three bar charts. Uh, each bar chart represents in total the maintenance and operations collections, so we're not including the, the debt service collections here since recapture doesn't impact them. Uh, so in each chart, the blue represents what the state takes from us through recapture taxes, and the red represents what Plano ISD gets to keep. So the first bar was for the year that we just wrapped up, the 2015-16 school year, we had 474, a little over $474 million in total maintenance and operations collections. About 53 million of that went right to the state, which left us with about 421 million. So this year, even though we're adopting or recommending it that you adopt the same rate of $1.17, the grand total for those collections does go up to 515 million, which is about a $41 million increase, but our recapture payment goes up almost 45 million to a total of 97.5. And so we're actually left with a little less money uh, that we get to keep from that tax than, than we were last year. That's attributed, the decrease is attributed to a couple of things. One, the, the lag factor in the property values hitting recapture is a year, and then also as our uh, enrollment has declined a couple of hundred students, then uh, that, would, that would normally generate all other things being equal, that would generate a decline. Uh, but the point being that unlike cities and counties that if their total collections, if they kept the same rate and it went up $40 million, they get to keep that. We don't. Uh, and in fact, even with this same rate, we're working with less money than we did for 2015-16. If we wanted to keep the, the levy exactly the same for the taxpayers, we could adopt a rate of $1.7.1 cents. So we'd generate the same $474 million that we did last year, but we'd still owe the state an extra 26 million or so, and that would mean that we would lose another $22 million to recapture. Uh, and so compared to last year, we'd actually be working with $26 million less. So we're in a very different situation than the, the cities and counties are when it, it comes to their tax rate and uh, the fact that they get to keep all of theirs. This is really not a new phenomenon. I think uh, it's just really been exacerbated the last year or two because of the large increase in property values. As we've said before, that's, that's great that the value of your home goes up until every fall when you have to write the check for the property taxes on it and at that point you wish it wouldn't have gone up as much if you're selling you do uh, but again this is not a new phenomenon i wanted to really isolate the impact over the last four years and then look ahead to 2018 if nothing happens in the next legislative session and if we gain just say another five percent in property values next year i want to show you what the trend continues to be. So our appraised values over the last four years, and again projecting another 5% for fiscal year 18, will have grown from 36.4 billion to 48 billion. That's an increase of 32% in our values. The reason I use those five years is because that was after the, our own TRE passed. So the tax rate hasn't impacted it. It's been a flat $1.17 all of the years that I'm including in these charts. So obviously if, you, if your value's gone up 32% and your rate stayed the same, well then your increase in tax collections is roughly 32%. So over the last five years, our collections have, uh, have increased from 409 million to 539 million, which is about $130 million. 
if you look at what we actually got to retain for the students in Plano, it only will have grown from 380 million to about 399, an increase of less than 4.8 percent over a four-year period, which equates to a little less than 1.2 percent per year if you average that out. So the big question is, well, what happened to the rest of it? And this chart shows that the state recapture tax uh, will have grown from 29 million to 140. So that recapture tax over that five-year period that the state takes from us will have increased almost 400 uh, percent to the tune of a little over 111 million dollars. So if you kind of put those two charts together, this kind of summarizes it. The blue is the indication of, uh, of the taxes that we retain here to educate students in Plano. The red indicates the amount that we send to the state for their use for education or other purposes. And so you can see from 2014 to 2018, uh, the blue part of that graph is pretty level, but the state uh, part just kind of continues to, uh, to grow exponentially. If you break that out, I think it means a, a little more if you actually look at the tax rate and say how much of that tax rate is the state taking from us. Uh, in 2014, they were taking a little over eight cents of the dollar seventeen, so we were left with about a dollar nine. Uh, if nothing changes next year, our rate, although it stayed a dollar seventeen, we will have only uh, we're only able to retain about eighty seven cents of it with the state then taking 30 cents. Uh, you have a resolution right after this dealing with transparency, and I think this slide really speaks to the lack of transparency. Uh, if Plano ISD had imposed an extra 22 cent tax rate uh, on its citizens without a vote or really without any notice, uh, the tax bill doesn't say it's recapture, it says Plano ISD if we had done that, I can only imagine the outcry about the lack of transparency and how we had uh, uh, raised the rate from eight cents to 30 cents, but yet that's exactly what the impact of the recapture tax has done over the last five years. So, with that in mind, uh, tonight we're gonna act, actually ask you to adopt a tax rate. In state law, there's lots of different tax rates mentioned there, they get, very confusing. Uh, the first that you've probably read about a lot over the summer is the effective rate. That's the rate necessary to produce the same amount of taxes as last year from properties that were on the tax roll in both years. So it, it doesn't uh, include the impact of any uh, new construction and it ignores what your payments are on your, on your any new bonds. As we calculate that rate, it's a little under $1.35. Uh, about a dollar seven point eight of that would be M and O, so it's very similar to that third scenario that I showed a few slides back, where we looked at a dollar seven point one tax rate, uh, and so it would put us pretty much in the same boat. Our, our if we did levy the effective rate, uh, we would be down almost twenty million dollars compared to, to last year in our operating budget. The second rate that the state uh, requires us to calculate is the rate necessary to maintain the same level of M&O revenue per pupil and paid debt service. That's, that rate's calculated uniquely for school districts. Uh, so that basically says what rate would you need to where you had the same amount per student for maintenance and operations, and then you also had the rate to pay your debt service. Uh, that rate's $1.44.7 including an M and O rate of $1.17.8, but we aren't even allowed to get there. Uh, so we have to adopt a rate where we don't maintain the same uh, level of M and O revenue per pupil. Uh, and that's our rollback rate, which is $1.439, and that's, as the fourth item indicates, that's what we're proposing tonight. And just to editorialize, to add insult to injury, uh, state law requires that any motion to adopt the resolution that sets a tax rate that exceeds that first effective tax rate that I walked you through has to be made in the following form. So the motion tonight will have to say, I move that the property tax rate 
be increased by the adoption of a tax rate of $1.439, uh, which is a 6.83% increase in the tax rate, even though that's not money that we get to keep. Uh, there is, you have the resolution in your packet as well. There's some specific wording in there. Uh, what I really like about it will be the last sentence that says that that tax rate will raise taxes for m and on a $100,000 home by approximately zero because that's the amount. The rate's the same. If the home value is 100000 then the increase is zero. So our resolution looks like it doesn't make sense, but it complies with state law. And then we'll have to make a very similar statement uh, after this tax rate's adopted. We have to post a similar statement on the website. Uh, we will take a little bit of latitude, though, and uh, include a paragraph below it that uh, describes that the impact is really necessitated uh, because of the increase in the recapture tax that the state takes. So, Madam Chairman, that is the presentation. Uh, the recommendation is that you approve the resolution adopting the 2016-17 tax rate and in order to comply with the statutory language you'll need to, the motion to adopt it will need to include the language that's uh, specified in your packet. Um, Thank you Steve. Do, before um, he ends his presentation do we need to make the motion and then ask questions or can I ask him a question about his presentation? Go ahead and ask questions. Okay. Um, can I ask you a question on, I think it's like slide five, if you, are you able to go back or will that mess up this whole process? No, that's, that's fine. That's the taxes on an average resident. And an average residence, correct me if I'm wrong, is $250,000 or somewhere in that neighborhood? Uh, over 300. This year, is is, it? it was over 300 this year. Okay, well, I'm behind the times. All right, well, that um, slide that had fiscal year 06 and it had the green line and it showed the tax on an average residence in 2006 was 3,919 and then you go back all the way up to fiscal year 17 and it shows the tax on an average residence is 4,285 so I wondered and you may not have this information available for us because this is a very on-the-spot question but is there a way to present what I would consider a portion of that as the recapture tax. Because if I'm in a home that's valued at the average value and I'm writing a check for $4,285, how much of that is going into the recapture fund, the general fund? That is there a way to know that number? Yeah, we could, we could break that out. I, ha I do have those numbers. Uh, I don't go all the way back to 06 because the rate was varying, but yeah. I do have it. Uh, just for the last for the year. last four years since the TRE was passed. Uh, That'd be great. So for fiscal year 2014, the the recapture tax was $200, uh, and for fiscal year 17, it'll be $658. So it's increased uh, 458. I think the the total increase over those four years is 741. So the recapture portion of it is almost two thirds. Okay. Uh, but yeah, the, the recapture taxes on the average residence in Plano are now $658. Okay. All right. And one, one other question about your presentation. You showed um, the estimated growth and what it would be for fiscal 2018, and you anticipated a growth rate of 5%. In your estimation, is that kind of a very um, conservative number given? The growth rate that we've seen in the past few years yes i uh unless there's something really changes between now and january 1st with home sales and property values i think it'll i would project it would be high i don't know how much but i think the five percent would be conservative okay so as the property year. values go up that amount that the ta taxpayer is going to remit is going to continue to go up right. and that recapture portion is going to go beyond 600 and whatever you quoted me right. okay all right but right. probably more more so than your chart shows because the right. five percent growth is a rather conservative that's, okay that's actually correct. if we factor in a recession in the next few years 
a decline in property value mm -hmm. because it takes a year to catch up. So we may have a decline in property values, but recapture is still going to go up. Right. Right. Steve, I would say uh, with regard to the, the question that Nancy raised, uh, I'd like to, in January after the year is over, I'd like to come back with this chart with uh, once we get an idea as to what actual property value growth is. I guess maybe that's not going to be probably till next summer right, uh, after July. appraisals are in. But maybe next summer I'd like to see the same chart with the actual numbers because I'm, like Nancy, I think we're probably talking 8 to 10 percent, okay. not 5, which just makes the hockey stick that much faster yeah. going up. I think the probably one of the easiest ways it's such a complex thing to describe but probably the easiest way is for each student that we have uh, for each penny of tax effort we collect if you average it out we get about fifty one dollars per student for each penny and so it's just simple if the property base base uh, generates more than that we don't get it the state does so uh, until those levels that, that the state pays us per penny increase or that they let us retain then all the property value increases eventually accrue to the state not us so just just to summarize if we adopt the same tax rate of a dollar 17 for MNO um, we lose five million dollars if we adopt a tax rate that allows the uh, uh, taxable uh, dollars paid by uh, homeowners to be equal to what it was last year then we lose 26 million right. and if we lower it you still owe it yeah. right so um, I know you know the answer to this, and it's not in the presentation, so I'll, I'll go ahead and ask you just for the purpose of sharing with others. How many other school districts in Texas are in this boat with us? Uh, I believe there's about 240 or 50 that, uh, that actually remit payments to the state in terms of recapture. Uh, but quite honestly, in some way or another, all 1,100 districts are with us because even if you don't pay uh, recapture, that amount that you're allowed to keep is set, and so the state's making up the difference, and if your values go up, they're gonna send you less money. And the bottom line is you still don't have any more money, so I would, I would really suggest that all school districts are in that boat, because whether you're chapter 41 or not, the state is getting the benefit of your property value increases. The, uh, the local school system is not. But, but to your point, there, there are a few other uh, interesting statistics. Um, there are three districts in the state of, in the state of Texas, uh, Austin, Highland Park, and Plano, that constitute, that paid 23% of all recapture in the state. Here in uh, Collin County, seven out of the 16 school districts are paying recapture Plano is paying or has paid 92% of all of Collin County. And since the inception of the recapture, 93, we paid $1.4 billion, $1 billion. Plano. Right. Just Plano alone. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, on that happy note, on that happy note, we'll take action on this and then we'll leverage the commentary that we've just had into the next topic for conversation. So at this point in time, do I have a motion? Uh, let's use the uh, appropriate language that is required. Yeah. I'm try I can't get that. No one really wants to make this motion. Yeah. So yeah. I move that the property tax rate be increased by the adoption of the tax rate of $1.439 which is effectively a 6.83% increase in the tax rate. Do we have a second? Second. Any other conversation, discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. Motion passes unanimously. Okay, so you know we were super excited about that. You're probably wondering, well, what are we gonna do about it? 
and that's the subject of the next topic uh, that we're going to discuss. Uh, we don't have, you know, a lot of tools in our arsenal necessarily to change this, but we're going to use our advocacy tool to the best of our ability. So um, here on in on the board, we organize a lot of our work into board subcommittees, and we have one uh, that's been working on legislative issues, and that consists of uh, board vice president Nancy Humphrey, trustee David Stolle, and me. And we have worked together to draft a proposed resolution regarding property tax relief and transparency and taxation. I would like to call upon board secretary Carolyn Mobius to read the resolution now. Resolution of the Plano ISD Board of Trustees regarding property tax relief and transparency in taxation. Whereas the Plano Independent School District, Plano ISD, believes the state of Texas does not adequately or appropriately fund public education in the state of Texas, the state, and whereas the Texas Supreme Court described the current public education funding system utilized by the state as Byzantine, undeniably imperfect, with immense room for improvement. And whereas Plano ISD supports a revision to the current public education funding system utilized by the state to assure that the state adequately and fairly funds public education. And whereas Plano ISD is committed to transparency and taxation, budgeting, and spending at all levels of government, and whereas Plano ISD believes the current public education funding system utilized by the state lacks transparency, and whereas Plano ISD on behalf of its taxpayers advocates that taxes collected in the name of public education must remain and be expended solely on public education and not diverted to other state expenditures or priorities. And whereas increases in tax revenues resulting directly from the rise in po property values in Plano ISD and other school districts across the state reduces the state's obligation to fund public education. And whereas the reduction in the state's obligation to fund public education allows the state to shift general fund revenue previously used for public education to other state programs resulting in both a lack of transparency in taxation and over-reliance on local property taxes. And whereas pursuant to data recently published by the state's legislative budget board, the state's level of funding for pre-K through 12 public education has declined from $4,558 per student in 2009 to $3,887 in 2017 a decrease of $671 per student, or 14.7%, even without accounting for inflation. And whereas Plano ISD recognizes that increases in property values have resulted in increased property tax burdens on taxpayers in Plano ISD and in other communities, and whereas the current public education funding system utilized by the state does not allow tax revenue resulting directly from increases in Plano ISD taxpayers' property values beyond state-determined equalized wealth levels to stay in Plano ISD, but instead requires that such revenue be remitted to the state in the form of additional recapture. And whereas Plano ISD desires to provide property tax relief to all Plano ISD taxpayers, and whereas the current public education funding system utilized by the state, including but not limited to the state system of recapture from property wealthy districts such as Plano ISD, prohibits Plano ISD from offering meaningful property tax relief. And whereas Plano ISD believes public education funding should grow annually by a rate of not less than the rate of inflation and the rate of population growth. And whereas the current public education funding system utilized by the state does not provide automatic annual adjustments to the various equalized wealth levels to the rate of inflation and the rate of population growth. Now therefore be it resolved that the Plano ISD petitions that Texas legislator to take action during the upcoming 85th regular session related to public education finance to one. Reform the school finance system to restore adequate and fair funding to all public independent school districts. Two, assure that 
in order to establish transparency and fidelity in taxation at all levels of government, the state eliminates the practice of reducing the state's funding obligations to public education because of increased property tax revenues resulting from the growth in property values, a practice which allows the state to divert state funds previously allocated to public education to other priorities. Number three, assure that public independent school districts have greater ability and incentive to provide local property tax relief by eliminating the possibility that future increases to maintenance and operations rate previously approved by taxpayers might cause the district to sub subject voters to the cost of another election to ratify that same rate again. Number four, assure that public independent school districts have flexibility to provide local property tax relief without losing net available revenue due to increases in such districts recapture payment to the state. Number five, provide automatic annual adjustments to the basic allotment in each of the equalized wealth levels relative to the rates of inflation and population growth in the current or any future public education funding system utilized by the state. Number six, provide a consistent and fair balance between local maintenance and operations taxes and the state's contribution to public education adopted the sixth day of September 2016 by the Board of Trustees of the Plano Independent School District. Do I have a motion to accept the resolution as read by Carolyn? I move that we accept the resolution. Do we have a second? Second. Any discussion? Yes. Who goes <laughs> <laughs> first? Ladies first? <laughs> Uh, couple, and I'll keep it really short. Um, what's, what's ironic is that the recapture that we're kind of outlining here is part two. Part one is adequate financing. And then we also want to stand for um, the flexibility to provide tax relief to our taxpayers and not lose net revenue and, and not be able to provide the level of education to our students that we we um, need. So what's frustrating to me is when we talk about the recapture amount going up, it's based on an increase in our home values and our property values, our co corporate properties as well as our homes. But the reliance on that growth in property value is a non-sustainable revenue source. And so um, I think Yoram, you made a reference a moment ago about budgeting in a recession. So if property values are to decrease, that <coughs> source of revenue that the state has been getting and um, using to fund their portion of the liability to the permanent school fund, that may disappear. So we would really want our legislators to provide a sustainable revenue source to fund public education. And um, the recapture amount that we pay, our, our subcommittee was talking about it, and we really feel it's a tax. It's not shown as that. So the other tenant that we're really wanting is to provide transparency and taxation so that our citizens understand when they write their check, where is it going? And, and there, it's not clear at this point. And um, so I think that number four, I don't remember in the resolution, it's very mechanical and it's a little bit, um, if you don't understand school finance, it's, it's just kind of hard to grasp. But the mechanics are we need to tie the calculation of our recapture tax on some form of a index that's annually adjusted. Because currently the number that we're comparing our weighted average daily tenants, well, property wealth is compared to a number from 2004. And so of course that differential continues to rise and therefore the state gains that recapture tax and they put it into the general fund and it may or may not be funding education. So there's that lack of transparency. So I will turn it over to you. Those were the points I wanted to make. Yeah, the, the subcommittee, we did a, a, quite a bit of work on this 
resolution to bring forward to the board, and which I, I fully support and hope that we adopt. Um, and, and we intentionally and very thoughtfully titled this a resolution regarding property tax relief and transparency and taxation because uh, of those two items, um, which we all believe are very important, you hear a lot at the state level about needing property tax relief and advocating for property tax relief. Um, a lot of our state elected officials, uh, that's number one on their radar. Um, and certainly we also would like to be able to provide our taxpayers with some property tax relief. But as, as Steve, in his presentation, asked, you know, where is that money going? I think the, the next question is why is it going this way? Well, I can tell you where it's going. P public education is funded by three buckets of funds. Property taxes, other state funds, and federal funds. Federal funds is a very small portion of that. As between property taxes and other state funds, in 2008, it was an equal level of, of funding. It was a, both about 42% of the overall budget, but they were generally equal portions of the budget. Over the last eight years, the reliance on property tax has grown to where they are now relying on over 50% for, uh, for property taxes to pay for more than 50% of public education funding, while the federal funding level has stayed the same, which means the decrease is at the state level. So why are they not interested in reducing our recapture payment because they need that money. They need our property tax dollars, our recapture dollars for other purposes. What are those other purposes? You, that's what we need to ask our elected officials what they're doing with that money. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a fair question. And that's where the transparency and taxation comes in. Um, what our state does with the funds, these property tax dollars is of utmost importance because people around here think the recapture dollars are going to pay for education, and it's not. It's being leveraged by the state to go pay for other things, which is an abomination to me. Um, this has got to be fixed. The, the, the charts that Steve shows with the amount of recapture skyrocketing is not gonna taper off anytime soon, and it's a hockey stick, okay? They're gonna continue to rely on recapture dollars that they can fund other things with their own money. This has to stop now, and right now, they're bleeding this district to death, and they're gonna bleed other districts to death as well. And so, I fully support this resolution. It's important for us to do this, in my opinion. Uh, and that not only that, it's important for us to now take this resolution to our taxpayers so that they understand what's happening with their tax dollars, and so that they can start asking questions of their elected officials as well. How are you spending this money? How is the state balancing its budget, why are they having an over-reliance on recapture dollars and local property tax dollars, what are they doing with the Delta? Because it's important. And we and, can't find and we And those are questions that need to be answered. Um, last legislative session when they were talking about um, getting rid of the business franchise tax or business margin tax, I was, which helps support public education. And my question at several <laughs> several events was, um, well, what's gonna replace it? Because I know that it helps fund public education. They never answered the question. Um, so I thought, okay, so we won't have that revenue for public ed in the state. And then um, the next um, thing that just frustrates the bejeebers out of me because I like to say words like that, um, is that you know they say that they're so proud of our schools, but yet they haven't shown that they're willing to invest in public education properly. Public education is the future of our state. We want to make sure our kids are ready to be contributing members to society. So show me that you're going to um, invest in something that is meaningful for everyone that lives in the state of Texas. The last thing I wanted to just kind of ask, is there any way that we can have the appraisal district, um, when they send out their invoices to us, that they can state how much goes to the state and how much we get to keep? Because it's not, um, 
I, I just think it, it's frustrating because there's still so many people who don't understand that we do not get to keep that money here. And it doesn't matter how you, you know, how many people we talk to or what forums we go to, it's just over the majority of the people, they just don't remember or don't understand that that's how it works. So I would love it if we could do something like that. Uh, unfortunately, the language on the tax bills is prescribed by the state. Oh, I don't think they'll help me. No. So <laughs> Can we the, put a rider in there? For instance, last year, <laughs> last year when the tax bills went out, the law prescribed, prescribed that they include a statement that told the taxpayers how much the $10,000 increase in the homestead exemption would save them. But well, the, the state's all about transparency when it's transparency of, that affects us. And they want, they want elections for tax ratifications. They want specific language on your tax, on your motion to increase your taxes. But it, when it comes to transparency at their level, it's you a different ballgame. So yeah. maybe, yeah, that's a, maybe that's a remedy that we recommend for transparency purposes. The remedy is oh. change the tax code like to, uh, Reflect. to identify the number of pennies associated with this recapture tax. So um, in our work mm -hmm. together on the legislative work, let's consider making that a remedy okay. uh, recommendation. Other discussion? Uh, I had two comments. One, um, you know, if you live in the city of Plano, 64% of your property taxes goes to PISD. I know as soon as uh, we estimated the property values went up about 9%, I think they went up uh, maybe even slightly more than 9%. Um, th there was an uproar on uh, we're going to be paying 9% more uh, in dollars. And so all the te taxing entities such as school districts and the cities and counties and college uh, need to reduce their tax rates. And it was very easy for everybody to start reducing their tax rate until it got to us. Well, 64% um, of the tax rate of the taxes you pay go to PISD. 52% is our MNO budget. Those 52% are subject to recapture. And what happened is that we can't touch those 52%, and it almost makes everything else. Uh, Un, un, it's unrealistic to try and, and change anything else that, that we can collect. That's one point. The second point is, um, you know, incentives drive behavior. And I remember when I ran the first time in 2013, and, and I had this great idea that if we're going to improve the quality of education here, we're going to increase demand, and especially since Plano is almost built out, uh, we're going to get to the point where, where the prices of properties go up so greatly and we collect taxes and we can even reduce our tax rate and still get more money for education. Well, that formula is broken because what happened is property values went up 9% and we are going to lose $4.8 million in the process. Mm -hmm. And so if incentives drive behavior, right. what behavior are we expected to drive based on the fact that we're going to be losing? $4.8 million on an increase of our property values. So in short, we would like to reduce taxes, but our hands are tied. <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not our taxes. This is a state property tax collected through school districts. Yeah. That's what it is. It is, but unfortunately, the Supreme Court didn't see it that way this last go around. But that's why we're in, um, in a hurry to get the word out because January 2017, our legislators come to the table and um, the Constitution of the State of Texas, Article 7, Section 1 says, a general diffusion of knowledge being essential to the preservation of the liberties and the rights of the people, it is the duty of the legislature to make suitable provision for the maintenance of an efficient system of free public schools. And so I bring that up because they go to the table in the um, House and Senate and they're gonna come up with how are we going to fix this school finance system because the Supreme Court kind of gave them a push to do so. And so that's why we're really wanting to get the word out so that our constituents understand what the truth is with their taxation. Well, I, I actually 
notwithstanding what the Supreme Court said, I agree with you, Orrin, this is a statewide property tax. Absolutely. And it, it drives me absolutely bananas to see state elected politicians talking about the need for property tax relief when they are the problem in the first place. And, and Steve made a point, uh, I'm, I'm not sure that that point was, was clear enough for everyone. If we wanted to reduce our taxes such that we collect the same amount of dollars, we would collect what the amount of money that stays in PISD is going to be $26.3 million less. 26.3, we collect exactly the same amount, we lose $26.3 million. Can I ask one quick question, Steve? Did uh, The other day, I swear I read an article that said the state of Texas um, is going to have a budget shortfall, like $500 million. Did you see that? I didn't see the amount. I, I know that they're, uh, they're not meeting the revenue targets with the current budget. Oh. So, so we they, might have they've some asked revenue. every agency to cut, I think, 4% in their request. You know, I'm not sure how we're going to get any of the legislators who are not Chapter 41 to change their minds about recapture because we're just in the minority and that seems to be how the vote continues to go. So I'm really interested in seeing how we might be able to change that in any way we can. Well, but you know, that recapture is based on that property value increase and that bubble's going to pop. And so it's up to the state legislators to find a sustainable revenue source. And I think Steve pointed out quite um, eloquently that even the chapter 42 districts are impacted by this because even as their property values go up, they, they're collecting a little more tax in local dollars, mm -hmm. but if the state is offsetting or reducing their liability to make that differential up because their property value is creeping up. So, um, they might want to adopt this resolution. They're free to adopt the resolution and maybe take out a paragraph that talks about the recapture, but they are impacted as well as we are. I mean, it, it's, it's kind of the same boat. One, one is in the front and one is in the back, I guess, but I don't know where we are. Yeah, this whole system is, is set up to rob Peter to pay Paul, and it affects all districts equally. It, it may affect 41s a little bit more because we're paying recapture as well, but when dollars, a, additional tax revenue that's generated by property value growth is filling up the bucket and allowing the state to reduce its obligation, that's affecting everybody, every, every taxing entity that provides those property dollars, 41 or 42. Okay, I think we've had discussion. We have a motion <laughs> and a second and discussion. Uh, let us vote. All in favor, please raise your hand. Motion passes unanimously. All righty then. The uh, next topic is strategic plan outcome indicators. And at this time, Superintendent Dr. Bingley will request the board to consider and approve the strategic plan outcome indicators that has been developed collaboratively, collaboratively by the administration and the board, Dr. Bingley. Yeah, we don't always get two super exciting items in a row, but that's what we have tonight. <laughs> Wait, three. Well, Wait for the yeah, rest. three with the resolution, yeah. Uh, now, I, I want to share with the board and our community a brief synopsis of a fairly lengthy and inclusive process that brings us to this item. For several years, PISD has had two broad school board goals, to ensure continued improvement in student learning and ensure the efficient use of resources. So after interaction with a variety of stakeholders, we brought to the board, really, almost a year ago, four operational expectations under each goal that were designed to guide our work, attempt to, as the name suggests, better operationalize what we're attacking with regard to improved student learning and, and efficiency in the use of resources. Uh, as a reminder of the trustees, those are uh, in your packet and they are appearing on the screen now for the benefit of the audience, four under student learning and then four more in efficient use of resources. So following the creation of those operational expectations, we deputized internal and external stakeholders to serve on eight different project teams, one for each operational expectation, uh, whose task was, would be to take input from what turned out to be over 2,000, I believe, maybe well more than that, 
uh, other stakeholders about what things would be good to measure if we could uh, to give us information about our success in working toward these expectations. So at the cabinet level, we put those together, uh, those results from those project teams uh, who worked. We have some folks who led some of those project teams, was several months, right, um, on, on creating those. Um, shared, uh, we put them together in one large document that we shared with the board in a workshop setting last year. Uh, and as trustees know, there were over 100 different quantitative and qualitative measures that we will track connected uh, back to aspects of our eight operational expectations. Uh, the board in that workshop gave us their input on some indicators that they wanted to see added, and we shared back with the board how those changes had been made. Uh, following that effort, we put a draft of targets for those items for which we already captured data. Uh, and shared with the board that in other cases, particularly in some of our survey uh, data, we would need to have this year one as baseline year. We don't, don't have historical data with some of those things. Uh, trustees gave us feedback about some of the targets, particularly in section 1.1, uh, and we made uh, quite a few changes to, in those based on that feedback, and that really is now the document that you, you have in front of you. Uh, finally, in our last meeting, we asked you to support a two-sentence, what, what we called a concept of purpose, which sought to clarify how, how would we use these indicators uh, to take a diagnostic approach uh, to ongoing decision-making. So that purpose statement noted that our outcome indicators represent a multi-metric approach to measuring longitudinal success in meeting strategic plan operational expectations. The analyses of these data in concert with each other and with ongoing interaction with schools and community provide us with valuable diagnostic information in support of organizational decision making. And so that really represents nearly a year long journey uh, to identify uh, the indicators that we would like to start measuring longitudinally and presenting those results to our schools and to our community. So we ask that you approve uh, them tonight that, so that we may begin that effort. Okay, so do I have a motion to accept the outcome indicators as shared by Dr. Bankley? I move that we approve the strategic plan outcome indicators as submitted. Do I have a second? I second. Any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. Oh, your arm's not here. Oh, okay. Okay, we'll, we'll continue. Okay, please raise your hand in favor. All opposed? And we'll, I guess, count him as an abstention. Motion passes. Thank you, Thank Dr. You. Binkley. I know that there was a, a lot of effort and care that was taken to develop all of those uh, belief statements and really operationalize our strategic plan. And uh, I, I I'm excited about it, so thank you. Thank you, I, and I do want to thank the folks out there. That, you know, I think that probably the biggest thing in all of this is when we went out to that many citizens and just internal customers and said, okay, think out of the box if you have to, and, and, and you know, some of these things are hard to measure. How do you recommend we do that? And we had some interesting <laughs> uh, ideas, and, and some of them are gonna be hard, but we, we think they're the right things to keep our eye on. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, as we uh, start each school year, we make some new appointments to some board advisory committees. And tonight, uh, we are considering for adoption some new appointments for the five committees that the board uh, appoints. It's a three-year uh, commitment of serving on each of these committees. I will just... Uh, read the names of these committees for your pleasure. Uh, career and technical education, uh, diversity, school health, special, special education, and the gifted talented committee. So um, included in your packet is a list of members from, uh, you know, who've been previously appointed and uh, new members. In addition to those that are listed here before you, 
you will, well, not in addition to, but I, I just want to make a point of, of pointing out that uh, Nancy and I met with um, Penny Chapman last week, and we were sharing the plans for this and saw a great opportunity to involve the PTA leaders on the council because there's a great uh, correlation between these committees and some chairmen on, that sit on the PT, uh, PISD Council of PTAs as uh, in, in their current capacity. So uh, you will see a, uh, an indicator about who those individual names are, and we would like to uh, ask the board to consider that new inclusion in uh, you know, our process of appointments. We haven't necessarily done that right. particularly, but it seemed like a great opportunity to collaborate on some common goals. Can I add something to that? Please. Because um, it was a really good dis discussion that we had with Penny. And um, we're looking, the Plano Council members are committees of the Plano Council of PTAs. Each one of them is a committee chair. And that committee chair is responsible for outreach to the 70 different PTAs in that particular um, committee work and so they support the individual PTAs and they bring information back and forth so we thought it would be a wealth of knowledge of a, a way to include many many great minds because believe me the people in that room <laughs> the committee chairs I was so impressed with their backgrounds and um, I think that room of 15 20 people I think there's one guy I can't say women but they could rule the world so I think it's a great benefit to bring them on as um, a, a member of each one of our five board advisory committees and I do believe that um, the PTA is looking into adding it as a standing rule for the council so okay. that's my input on the okay. so just as a question and maybe Nancy this is what you were alluding to this we are appointing the chair of the committee as opposed to the individual that's so fine. that annually as that per as a new person rotates into that chair yes, position that correct. is correct that is correct because i believe do they have a terminant ter two-year term limit on Tamara? do you Tamara, know is there a term limit is there a term limit per committee oh, so i was thinking you can serve forever well you can but you can't stay in that same committee <laughs> anyway okay so we offer this uh, uh list of board advisory committee members for your consideration uh, do we have a motion to accept as presented? I move that we approve um, the advisory committee appointments as submitted. Do I have a second? Second. Um, any discussion? Can I nominate one more person? I just, uh, when I saw the list uh, yesterday, I realized that uh, there was somebody and I talked to her and she was still interested in uh, joining. She had, I know that she had issues last year, okay. but would like to join. Go ahead. This would be Go good. Ahead. Okay, then Teresa Bronski for special education. So you've already talked to her? Is yes. Okay. She, she was on the committee last year and uh, had some issues that prevented her from attending all the meetings. Okay. But I asked her if, uh, th that's when I realized that uh, her name was missing, I asked her. And she said she would like to stay on the committee. Okay. So is that an so amendment to the motion? It would be if uh, we okay. make a motion. So I'd like uh, to make a motion to amend the original motion and add the name Theresa Bronski to the Special Education Committee. Okay, do we have a second to the amendment? Second. Okay, so let us vote on the amendment. All in favor of the amendment, please raise your hand. Motion passes. Okay, so now on the original motion. All as amended. As amended. All in favor, please raise your hand. Motion passes unanimously. Okay, thank you. Now we get to talk about what we will ask these committees to work on this year. So in your uh, materials, there is a description of the goal or goals that we would like to ask each of these committees to work on for the course of, this, of their service this year. Uh, we started this activity last year, and I'll just speak for myself and say I thought it was really productive. And we, I think we heard from them that it was productive for uh, those committee members that were serving as well. And, you know, if you look at what we're doing, we're 
we're putting their recommendations in place. I mean, it, it's it's not just uh, work to do work. It's 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 being used. So let's review for just a second uh, what the goals are, because I know some of the folks in the audience are leading these committees. So I want you to hear our conversation about the work. Um, let's start with career and technical education. There are, are there's some continuing work, and there is uh, some new work. The continuing work is continuing to define the demand for vocational certifications that are needed in the North Texas job market based upon real market data that will support existing and planned programs and support the board's high school academy development guidelines and goals, which will be shared at the next meeting. Then, identify potential business and education partners that work together to create new learning opportunities for our students. So, who do we need to partner with to bring these things to life? And then lastly, identify opportunities for students to study and or practice the discipline of entrepreneurship and identify community partners to help achieve that goal. Any commentary, thoughts? Okay. Next, so that's pretty much very similar to last year, mm -hmm. right? I mean, they made some recommendations, but now we're saying, let's let's move on. Right? The one thing we did say uh, that, that was included there is, uh, as you mentioned, in the next uh, work session uh, this month, we're going to be sharing the recommendations for guidelines and goals from the high school academies um, subcommittee, and uh, that this work mm -hmm. needs to be in uh, the way we said it support uh, the work of that committee okay so. very good so they'll have to pay attention to what's happening there yep. diversity advisory okay so for this committee and the gifted and talented committee they pretty much have a goal in common just like they did last year and at the conclusion of their reporting period last year they shared with us um, some recommendations that would help to support what was called at the time the Equal Opportunity Schools Initiative that has now been renamed Commitment to Equity Program. So we asked them at that time what is the, they talked about lots of opportunities. What is the one thing that you think would be uh, your top priority? And they said it would be the Parental Support Program. So we're giving them the task this year to develop and implement a parent support program in support of the district's commitment to equity program that is working to reduce student opportunity gaps. Uh, we're asking the diversity advisory committee to please collaborate with the gifted talented advisory committee who's also going to work toward the same objective. I, I might interject here that this programming is probably more for middle school and high school because of the opportunity program that it's supporting as our elementary academy subcommittee has explored programming in the district we really find a, um, an absence of programming to support parents at all levels and so i don't want to add any more work to this year but i think we should certainly think hard in the future about how we support parents of younger children as well i totally agree tammy and actually i didn't want to i didn't intend to be limiting in the scope of this um, I was just trying to refer to the history. So, uh, in our in our in our commentary, maybe we could say that um, I don't know if a parental support program would look different in elementary than it would at secondary. I have no idea. Um, do we want to be a little more descriptive and say to reduce student opportunity gaps at all grade levels? I think that would be wonderful. Okay. Uh, and just some of the, the research that Carolyn, Merrill, and I have been doing, talking with some of the elementary school teachers, the concerns of a parent of a preschool or kindergartner are very different even from a second grader parent. And so I think to have some different types of support would be wonderful. We also have a lot of support that's electronic, but we haven't... Um, we haven't distributed that information broadly about some of the tools that we do have, things like Reading Rosie program for the little kids. I think there's a lot more we can do to share what we're already doing in pockets. Okay. So let's hop over and on the gift and talent one, make that note to reduce student opportunity gaps at all grade levels. Good morning. Ms. Bender, could it connect to, I mean, the commitment 
to equity is a piece of that district initiative that is really about trying to do just exactly what you're talking about, and that goes pre-K on up to, I mean, you, in essence, you're doing it, but it, would, it might be another opportunity to tie that district initiative to their work, which is, is really what you're saying. Yeah, so we have the effect of what what terminology do you want to recommend? We could use some of the terminology. I mean, in the in the district initiative itself, it really is to. Um, I mean, I realize this is supporting parents, which which would be a vital part of, of kind of closing some of those opportunity achievement gaps. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, it may be more thinking that we need to do but the, the but it would be a good way to connect their work to right and that's to that's the intent really yeah but we're just trying to limit the scope to yeah. this year we want to see a parent support program of some flavor at all grade levels so um, I think that would be excellent because we, we do a lot of good work bird center Plano family literacy but relatively few families are touched by that work how can this support be more ubiquitous? Mm -hmm. Okay, so because I don't have the terminology in front of me, That's fine. can we go with this? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's going to do the same. It's going to do the same. Okay. Uh, health, school health advisory. Um, last year, we explored, we really wanted to task this uh, particular committee with a mental health objective. And uh, that they made some recommendations, they did some study. This year we really want to see uh, those recommendations implemented. So th the goals read as follows. Implement stress reducing measures for students and staff that were identified through the 2015-16 committee work. Uh, number two. Review studies related to contributors to suicide, identify best practices in suicide prevention, and recommend actions for the district to take. Number three, review findings from concussion research, identify best practices in concussion prevention, identification, and return to play, and recommend any changes to district practices. Now, a few notes about these goals. Since time and resources are obviously limited, the achievement of the stress reducing measures and suicide prevention measures take the highest priority among the goals listed. Uh, please collaborate with the district's guidance counseling department on the issues of mental health and suicide prevention and with the athletic department on the study of concussion research. Can I make a comment? Yes. Okay, because I know the Student Health Advisory Council is a required state um, committee that we're required to conduct. They have other business that they also have other goals in addition to these. Yes. I thought I'd just point that part out. Right. So we're giving them some latitude to say, you know, this this these goals were developed by Yarm and David and I, um, and so we're sharing them, you know, to see if you uh, agree. But in in our prioritization of effort, uh, for us the for the extra work to undertake, it would be in the mental health arena if there's not time to go beyond that. I guess I have a concern about this because certainly concussions are connected to mental health as unfortunately we saw too tragically last year. So I'm, I'm disappointed that we have to put that sort of prioritization in. I mean, we're a district of 6,000 employees. I would hope that we could work on all three of those initiatives because there is a clear and direct connection to mental health and concussions. I, I would hope that too, but as we saw on the career and technical education, <laughs> we couldn't get to everything, and I didn't want to set any. I don't want to set anybody up for. Uh, I mean, I, they don't meet that often, and maybe some staff members could weigh in and determine, maybe give us some input on whether what they think is reasonable. Is it? Do you think it's reasonable to undertake these three goals? Doesn't, um, Megan, I might not remember correctly, but doesn't that um, subcommittee or committee have to address concussions anyway? No? Shoot. Okay. Well, I, I'm on bar with Tammy, but I do think that we are um, missing some, I think, 
some opportunities to help kids know who to reach out to when they see a friend or even another student that they might not know um, is having problems. Um, I just, I, I think we need something more. They need to understand that the world doesn't end because of something that adults know is not important. Well, that all things will end up okay. But um, Carolyn, perhaps with um, that one that, I mean, the counseling um, and family and children's services are well uh, engrossed in that work right now. Um, so perhaps they could at least take the lead on that. And um, I, I am concerned, I, I appreciate the um, comment. These committees are really charged to meet four times a year. That's what people are signing up for. Mm -hmm. Um, and all three of those are are big so yeah. I think um, you know we can perhaps support that committee work through our group Carrie's group with the concussion protocol um, you know we have a social emotional and uh, health advisory committee that's also meeting to um, which will help address some of the stress issues so maybe we can tag team with um, this group and provide some staff support as well so what if we what if we uh, entertain these three items and then following this uh, consideration tonight the subcommittee of David and Yoram and I will then be meeting as we did last year with the leaders the staff leaders of these committees to listen to share and talk a little bit more about this and listen to their concerns or input or feedback and then we will bring that back to you okay so for now if we can you know ask them to consider you know these are important to us and let's hear from them what they feel like they can do because three lives were lost last year in this district because of concussion. Three. So, you know, this is these all of these topics are very personal and emotional and important to all of us, and we're going to do everything we can to to uh, keep our students happy and healthy. Uh, the last item is uh, the gift and talented, which has the same parental support idea. And uh, an addition to that is to recommend any policies and changes to assure that the district does not block student progress in any way. So uh, any, any commentary or thoughts about this? I think on that uh, specific comment, uh, the idea behind it is uh, that, and, and we had a similar conversation in our last uh, meeting, the district, plays a great role as a safety net but we need to make sure that we never play the role of the ceiling we never are the ones that stop a student so whatever we need to do to make sure that we're not stopping progress that was uh, what's behind it okay i wonder if that parallels um, any of the work that we're doing with the districts of innovation could be maybe too much it's it, it's a uh, guiding principle that we need to make sure. All right. Uh, the yes. Yeah, I'd like to go back to the um, diversity. Okay. Thing. And I'd like to say that I think our student population is is becoming extremely diverse every year, and I don't think the staff equivalent uh, is the same as the diversity of the students that we have. And I'd like for the staff to see if they couldn't uh, uh, find some accountability in looking into hiring more minority staff in the district. I think we're pretty long on Tax that. rates with up. So for, for this, these are goals for the committee to research? Yes. Is, so yes. are you asking for the committee to research? Looking at... Um, having the staff be accountable to go out and do more research for minority teachers and other staff. Okay, other, is, 
that legal? <laughs> Do? My question is, is what, um, what are you looking for? Because um, when in a research study I found the other day, and I can't remember what the title was, but I have it on this computer, but it did say um, that the population of the students, the makeup of the students did not have to be mirrored by the teachers, that the kids did just as well. It, it didn't seem to affect um, how well they bonded to their teachers and performed in school. So I can, I can send it to you if that's what your oh, concern think, is. Well, I think that I'm not saying that um, you have to have a correlation, you know, but I do think that we do need more minority staff. And I think that that's a reasonable thing to consider when you have a district the size and for the number of diverse of the diverse population that we have. I think that would be more of just a, a, a human resources. And we, yeah, we, we, we do. Not. We, we do capture that th those data. Well, yeah. and we we do have goals for the schools um, as far as um, hiring, trying to hire a diverse staff. That's something that we monitor each year. And um, if there are um, schools that are out of line with what our district expectations are, we work. Our, our group works closely with them and with HR and. Uh, helping to round out those um, candidates and the uh, people that are hired. Well, I know that when I was on the diversity committee, it was kind of a priority that the staff looked at it. But, you know, recently I know that that goal has kind of dissipated. And I, I've seen some of the figures on some of the minority uh, staff that we have, and it seems to be well below, you know, um, an average. I, I couldn't say this off the top of my head. I, I know recently we, we were looking at encouraging campuses to have approximately 12% was it was a district um, goal. goal. And so like I said, we, we continue to monitor, monitor that. I, I do agree, Marilyn, that several years ago that was really a high priority i think we've moved past that and are in kind of a monitoring stage now so do, how, how close are we to the 12 percent in many campuses they're at that or above in the campuses that aren't that's what i'm saying the campuses that aren't our group works with those principals and connects back to hr so that uh, that that continues to be a goal for the campuses that aren't there yet and if i if i could just offer this up as well you know marilyn i think you know that certainly that's a, the, a topic worthy of discussion um i don't necessarily know that that's something that we will have that we would ask the the diversity advisory committee to add on to the what they're already looking at simply because we were very careful in developing a goal here that is tied to another subcommittee's goal so that they can work together um, for, for a common outcome that will benefit a large number of students. And so I, I'm not in support of, of adding to their work here because I think what, that what we're charging them with is some heavy lifting that could have a very broad impact on a lot of students. Um, you know, anything that brings more parental support into the campuses is a phenomenal has an, an exponential impact on on these students performances um, so I would suggest that we, we not add that to it as a as a subcommittee goal this year but certainly maybe something to discuss with staff to see if that's this is a topic of conversation for a, a subsequent meeting yeah. and well, David wasn't your um, the 2016 2017 goal tied to work that they did last it, year so it's a carry forward it, of a program yeah I mean it, it's it is tied to the work that they did last year as well and well, it's related to our strategic initiatives and Marilyn so. shared with us how important with um, the subcommittee that we're on with Tammy on how important it is for parental um, support so I know that that's number one for her 
her. She made that clear to us. So, and the effects it has on the families. You know, and I wanted to correct myself too. It's actually 18%. So it's it it, it has risen, and that is something that we we continue to monitor and work with the campuses. Okay. Well, I know that you sent a report that it didn't reflect 18%. Well, how about as a follow-on activity, we we'll make sure that, that she gets some information to address her uh, concerns. concerns. Okay, so the last one is the Special Education Advisory Committee. And uh, we know that uh, we're going to uh, have an adult transition center in the works in the next 18 months or something along those lines. So um, we would like to have a report that identifies outside best practices to develop a prioritized list of program recommendations for implementation in the Adult Transition Center. And also to seek and evaluate parent input in the process of gauging interests and identifying service needs for off-site accommodations and services for students with significant behavioral disorders. So Dr. Bingley, this is in response to some work that we know that you're undertaking with some others in Collin County to look for off-site um, uh, service opportunity treatment opportunities that don't exist right now so we would like to give them the task of exploring the interest and in what services and, and, you know amongst I know you've been talking with staff your administrators we're interested to also know are the parents of these children that could potentially access these services, or would they like it? And what services would be of value to them? Okay, and I think that, um, you know, a happy outcome from the first bullet point to identify best practices for the adult transition center outside uh, practices, I think it might also be um, a, a good outcome of that would be um, helping the students that leave our adult transition center for other programs as they continue on there might be a great transition piece there so if if we have a student that um, leaves our adult transition center and maybe goes to the non parole Institute or my possibilities or some other um, I think it, we could identify some ways that there's an easy the transition bridge. a bridge yes. yeah okay. so that might be part of that work I would guess okay so um do you have a recommendation? Well, let me think how we, because I don't want to take them askew off of their, um, the goal that you had, but um, you're identifying outside best practices, right? And maybe one of the pieces would be to um, identify transition to other programs as our students move on or, uh, I don't have the words. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm trying to doodle a few here. Transition into work. Okay, how about that? In transition into work or work. other um, external, Education. other centers? Educational support programs? Or yeah. educational. Okay, well. We'll wordsmith it okay. and get some feedback from the from our follow-on okay. meeting with okay. the uh, okay. Can I can I ask a thought? And yes, Chr Christy, you Please. I know you're paying attention out there. I, could I? I think Christy may, maybe recommendation maybe recommend that they work in concert with our folks. I don't know in a previous life we sent visitation teams of staff and parents to 14 different sites in the state to just okay. see what they're doing. I would, we're gonna be, I know, engaged in that kind of work. I say welcome aboard. <laughs> Let, let's <laughs> perhaps merge those two, as opposed to two parallel trains. Right, we don't wanna be right. in two silos, uh, So I, that I would certainly yeah. hope that, that we might be able to bring them together and say let's really really study the best of what's out there and, and make that for our kids and, okay. and as opposed to they get charged with it her people are charged with it right and you got two trains we don't want two trains yeah. so. one train one conductor <laughs> okay other comments 
All right, so uh, do I have a motion? Did you have a comment? Well, actually, I have a question. So yes. if we're actually voting to approve as listed, so these different changes we've discussed, whether it's K-8 for parental support or uh, not taking the focus on concussions out of there, what are we actually voting on then? So we're, we're, we're not taking focus out. Uh, I, the comments, the adjustments that I made that uh, were adding the words at all grade levels on those two, and then some commentary about transition into work or other educational centers on the special ed. What I would like to do, uh, what I would suggest, is that we accept, the board would entertain accepting these. Then we will share these with the leaders of the district committees the staff members get their feedback and bring it back to you so just give us enough information to get them started and um, then we come back and they and say this was too much this was just enough this was an edit and then you know it's sort of like a, maybe a policy consideration this is sort of our first pass and then we won't send them off on their work until we get the final pass is that okay that's okay you know how strongly I feel about the concussion. I do. So let's let them give us their feedback and tell us what, you know, maybe they'll, I mean, knowing that, maybe they'll be able to come back and say, okay, knowing that these are all really important to us and the community, here's how we can break it up. And we'll do this and this group will do that. So, okay. Is that okay? All right. So um, do I have a motion to accept as discussed? <laughs> so moved. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, all in favor, please raise your hand. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Okay, um, at this time, Yoram and uh, Carolyn are gonna share with us a little bit of information from their subcommittee that has been reviewing the board operating procedures. So typically what we do, this is how we work together seven of us, how we work with the staff, how we work with each other, and every so often we review it. We've been doing that in a bulk fashion in the summertime, and I think Yoram and Carolyn have some new thoughts about that process. So would one of you like to take that? Go ahead. Sure, I'll, I'll start. So you do have that in your packet. Uh, it's the one that starts with background. It doesn't have a title, and the font was so much better on my screen. <laughs> uh, the, the operating protocol is the document that we uh, go by and um, I think it used to be that the newest board trustee <laughs> gets to work on this yeah. uh, in the first year, which is a great way to uh, be familiarized with it. Uh, it. This is how we do things and I think one of the things that both Caroline and I felt uh, pretty strongly is that we don't necessarily do things exactly as they're written in the operating protocol and so one of two things has to happen. Either we modify the operating protocol to reflect how we practice, or we change how we practice to reflect what's in the operating protocol. Now, there are two parts to this, and, and I know that uh, under the agenda it says that uh, we are looking for acceptance, but we're actually not creating anything new. It's, it's more of a description of uh, how we're planning on, on doing our work um, as charted currently by the operating protocol and the policies. So there are two parts to this. The first one is what are we going to do or how are we going to modify the operating protocol itself? But there is a second part to it that uh, reflects on policies and I'll get to that. So let's start with the first part. Uh, first of all, Last year, we really revised it back to back. We went from the beginning to the end. It had, uh, I believe, 74 pages at the time. We actually shrunk it a little. Um, but what we believe we should do this time is instead of working on the whole thing every time or once a year, instead what we're going to do is review this, modify on a regular basis. This is a live document. Uh, it is preferable that the modifications are incremental and continuous, so we're going to be bringing uh, smaller updates uh, on board meetings, so just like uh, we do with policies, uh, which I noticed, Carla, that we have about 57 policies <laughs> for tonight. Um, we're going to have a uh, recommendation for a change in the operating protocol and with the rationale. It's a lot easier to digest if we do it one at a time. 
uh, the operating protocol can support and uh, should support and be consistent with the board uh, with the boards and the district's mission, vision, and strategic plan. So this is not something that's uh, on its own. Uh, the operating protocols should be evaluated against current practices. When practice does not match the, uh, match the protocol, either we change the protocol or we point out the difference uh, or recommend uh, how we change what we do. Um, and, and point it out to the board, here is something in the protocol and we are not doing that, so we need to talk about whether we change the protocol or change what we do. <coughs> uh, the proposed changes uh, should be very specific with the exact new language as opposed to, and we'll talk about policies because we are in charge of creating our own uh, protocol. The uh, subcommittee will explore board operating protocols of other school districts, adopt best practices when appropriate. So let's see what others are doing in certain areas and if we find something that we should be adopting, let's do that. The board should include a regular board meeting agenda item for operating protocols. So that's one thing that we're asking, just like we have item 10 that's typically reserved for policies, maybe just have a placeholder so that if we do have something, we don't need to uh, shuffle the agenda, we'll have a placeholder for it. And the source of operating protocol modification requests should be outside of the uh, subcommittee uh, by other board trustees if that happens so that we don't violate the Open Meetings Act and one of you have uh, a recommendation to something we should change, just reach out to that committee and we get this as input and then uh, we feed this back to the uh, board as opposed to uh, holding a uh, conversation over it. Yoram, have you designated yes. a chair for that committee? Who's the chair? I don't know. Who's the chair? <laughs> she is. Okay. <laughs> the, the thought about not doing it all at once. I mean, if y'all remember, it just gets to that point where you're like, okay, I don't care, I don't care. <laughs> it's been hours. So we're trying to make it where it's meaningful dialogue because if we do find better practices or, hey, we really don't do this, and some of us may want to do it and some of us may not, it, it'll be a better, um, we'll just, it'll be more meaningful. And that's, it should be meaningful. And I think this is a perfect opportunity to, you know, have have it go throughout the um, year since there will be, you know, an election coming up, and that'll help educate whoever might be thinking about running, so they can hear the things we talk about on how we operate. And, and we will still find ways to haze new board trustees True. as they get elected. Yes, we're not going to give up on that. We have a procedure for that. Yes, yeah. we, we actually, that would be probably the first procedure we would work on. Uh, the second part is uh, review and amendment of district policies. So specifically the local policies that are uh, within our control, we can change them. Uh, and uh, we currently do have that under the operating protocol, uh, item D that reads, uh, local policy amendments may be initiated by the superintendent board members, school personnel and commu or community citizens. So what we are planning on doing here is to uh, coordinate collecting input regarding district policies from other board members, board, uh, members of the public and make recommendation to the boards for modification. Now, uh, we will first uh, be consulting with, as uh, per the current uh, policy uh, protocol that we have, we will consult with the superintendent designee, which would most likely be Car Carla, Miss Oliver, uh, regarding the proposed changes before forwarding the recommendation to the board. So we don't want to bring up something reflecting policies and then find out that that's not going to work. So we're going to work on that before uh, we recommend. Here we are not going to make specific changes with language because this uh, uh, falls under uh, Ms. Oliver's uh, role. So what we will bring up is there is a recommendation to change something. We'll talk about that in general. If we can agree, we're going to ask that it is being implemented and policies are, made ch are changed. Uh, one thing, and uh, including legal review and, and the process as it is today. Uh, one last comment is, uh, same comment as before with operating protocol, if any of the board trustees would like to make a change to policy, please direct it directly to the subcommittee as opposed to have a conversation so we don't violate the Open Meetings Act. Okay, any questions or comments? Two 
Okay. okay. So okay. you're not looking for um, acceptance of anything, but just really uh, wanting to provide visibility of this new process that you want to recommend? I, I think so. This is, um, I, I mean, we can adopt it or, or uh, accept it as, uh, through a motion. I'm just not sure if, if we have to, if we're not okay. creating a policy by it. It's really we kind of it. okay. how we do. Let's okay. have a motion then. Okay. All right. Since it's posted as such, we'll entertain a motion to accept the uh, recommended process modification as presented. In this case, I will make the motion to accept the um, operating procedure reviews process as presented. Okay. Do I have a second? A second. Okay. Any other discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. So now, all those changes you've been courting, send them on. Carolyn. All right, now we have some, just like last time, we have some fun policy work ahead. At most of our regular meetings, we have policies on the agenda for the board's consideration. They have undergone prior review by the district's attorney and by each board member. I invite Carla Oliver to introduce these policies. Ms. Oliver. Thank you, President uh, Bender. We're going to try to make this as painless as possible. The first three policies that you'll be considering are uh, for adoption under second reading. The first being DGBA local personnel management relations employee uh, complaints and grievances. Again, this is for adoption under second reading and is being updated to reflect the change in the district administrator responsible for conducting employee grievance, um, the appeal process at level three. Okay, do I have a motion to adopt item A on second reading? I'm so moved. <laughs> you need to read the whole thing. Second. You do? Do I have a second? <laughs> second. Okay. All in, uh, any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. Motion passes unanimously. <laughs> Item B. DGBA exhibit um, personnel management relations employee complaints and grievances. Again, this is presented for review, if you remember, rather than adoption under second reading as it is an exhibit. And it's also for the same process of changing the district administrator responsible for conducting the employee grievance appeal at level three. Mm -hmm. Do I have a motion to review? Item B on second reading. So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. Motion passes unanimously. <laughs> Item C. FD local admissions. This policy is represent, uh, I'm sorry, presented for adoption under second reading. Revisions have been made to the three FD policies presented tonight to reflect suge suggestions made by the TASB Legal Services. Do I have a motion to adopt item C on second reading? So moved. Have a second. second? Any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. Motion passes unanimously. <laughs> Item D. Uh, the next two are review as well as they are um, both an exhibit and a regulation. FD exhibit admissions. This exhibit is presented for review. The policy has been revised to reflect the common law definition of residency as cited in FD legal and to clarify that the listed forms of proof of residency are preferred but not exclusive methods of determining residence. Do I have a motion to review item D on second reading? So moved. Do I have a second? A second. second. Take your pick. Any discussion? <laughs> All in favor, please raise your hand. Motion passes unanimously. <coughs> Item E. FD regulations regarding admissions. Again, this is similar. Uh, this is for review under second reading. The regulation has been revised to clarify that a power of attorney form is obtained when possible from the parent to accompany the guardian guardianship information form. Do I have a motion to review Item E on second reading? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. Motion passes unanimously. <laughs> Item F, please. BDAA local officers and officials, duties and requirements of board officers. This policy is presented for approval under first reading and will be presented under second reading at a subsequent meeting. Uh, this revision is being made to allow board officer terms to begin at a first regularly scheduled board meeting following June graduation. 
Okay, do I have a motion to approve item F on first reading? So I move. Okay. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? I'll just clarify one thing. Um, I think that some people might read that and think that the newly elected board member won't start until after the June graduation. This is just for officers and serving their officer term. It's not elected board members. Thank you for that clarification. Carla, what was the genesis of that change? <laughs> if I can reach back just in my memory bank, um, we had, uh, I'm going to say in the mid-2000s, there was a request so that um, as students were going through that might be important to certain trustees and such that their names could appear on diplomas. Also, um, significant documents in the district at that time that were important so that it was revised at that time. I'm sorry, you may not be able to, could you hear me? Um, and so I, if I remember correctly, and this would be before I joined the district, that happened since I was in the district. I believe this reflects more of what it used to be. To simplify transition. Yeah. Right, because in regard to all, this, all the signatures that are required and the automatic um, signatures for lots of different documents. So I appreciate the work that the board did on that. So Nancy suggested it originally, so and she did some homework with some of Carl's people and uh, they found a way to uh, create the language mm -hmm. so that it would simplify the transition so that one board leader is not having to truncate their leadership before the exactly. end of the school year, right when we're trying to do retreats and lots of planning for the next year. So um, thank you. That's to, to be helpful. So we have a motion and a second discussion. Um, ready to vote. All in favor, please raise your hand. Motion passes unanimously. Item G is TASB Localized Policy Manual Update 105, affecting local policies. It's presented for approval under first reading and will be presented for adoption under a second reading at a subsequent meeting. Um, the motion is such that I will read, it is recommended that the board add, revise, or delete local policies as recommended by TASB Policy Service. And according to the instruction sheet for TASB Localized Policy Manual Update 105, with revisions as noted to the following policies, BJCF Local Superintendent in regard to non-renewal and DFBB Local Term Contracts uh, for non-renewal and update, updated, I'm sorry, legal policies, regulations, and exhibits were included in the update packet for you to receive. So this again is the standard update given regarding 105 and is presented for your um, consideration. Okay, do I have a motion to approve item G on first reading? I move that the board add, revise, or delete local policies as recommended by TASB Policy Service and according to the instruction sheet for TASB Localized Policy Manual Update 105 with revisions as known to the following policies. BJCF Local Superintendent Non-Renewal and DFBB Local Term Contracts Non-Renewal. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. The motion passes unanimously. So just so it's clear for everyone, the fact that the policy is superintendent non-renewal, this is not a vote of uh, non-confidence. <laughs> <laughs> superintendent needs a modification to a policy. I did want to share that it's sort of HR housekeeping uh, policy, so we it's not reflective of anything currently on the table. <laughs> that okay, I know. our last <laughs> policy. Just positioning. <laughs> <laughs> last policy is item F. Did you say F? I, I'm no. sorry. No. Oh. I meant to say H. Thank you. Thank you. I, I thought maybe I was me. Wrong. Let's do F again. Me. <laughs> Let's just take the next one. Uh, CDA local other revenues in regard to um, investments. This policy is presented tonight under adoption for first and final reading. Um, on August 2nd, 2016, a bond sale was approved. I think we shared some advance information for you in regard to this sale. In order to take advantage of historically low interest rates, the sale was sized at such that bonds proceeds will um, be 30, uh, $300 million. Completion of related projects will extend over a three-year period and as a result would be best to invest those proceeds in a manner to match projected cash payments. These are words that Steve Williams <coughs> has. <laughs> So essentially we've been advised by our 
financial experts outside of our um, district management, but district management by First Southwest Asset Management, which is a Hilltop Holdings company, that we've been advised that the revisions to our investment policy, CDA local, are recommended, which you've seen under separate cover. Okay. Do we have, do I have a motion to adopt item H on first and final reading? Um, do I have a second? Any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. <laughs> okay, typically we would uh, convene the 15 minute public comment session at this point in time. But, uh, Carla confirmed we do not have any speakers. So, with no further business, this meeting of the Board of Trustees is adjourned. I have my question for you.